it would be really useful if you can do that. And as far as asking questions, um, I'm sure we're going to have some great questions for Gabe. And if you could use the chat function, um, I'll be monitoring that and I'll be able to put those to Gabe as we go through the presentation. Um, so that's a little bit of housework. So we're scheduled for about 60 minutes. So enjoy. Please do send through the questions. And I'm going to hand over now to Gabe. Can't wait to hear your story, Gabe. Delighted to um, finally catch up with you again. I think as, as we were chatting earlier, I think we probably last met when you came to do a lifeguard course with us with our good friend Gordon, who I, I can see is, I know is listening, um, back in the early 2000s. Is that, is that about right? Uh, yeah, I'm not that precise on the date, Chris, but um, it, does, it probably is that long ago. Um, and I remember really fondly that time um, at Harlan and, and you know your crew that you've got there and it's fantastic what you've built up I've got to say Chris you're um, you know you've trained so many fantastic instructors and obviously um, clients you know like with that surfing or stand up paddling or any water sport honestly I think you must have sort of really supported thousands of people with water safety and you know that's just fantastic so honestly Chris it's an absolute pleasure to be with you tonight I'm buzzing that you asked me to um just to give a little bit of my story and thanks honestly to, to your contribution to the you know surf and water sports world it's, it really is uh, top level yeah thanks for that Gabe um it's been a pleasure you know over the years I've met some really great people and water skills academy now is going from strength to strength and uh, can't wait to hear your story now so maybe if you can have a brief introduction um I'm sure most people that are watching have heard of you, Gabe, but if there's the odd person that hasn't, if you give us a little bit of a background, um, you know, your, your surfing background, and uh, we can take it from there. Yeah, well, I'll start. I'll just fire straight in because I've got um, a few little clips tonight. I've got um, a little bit of the backstory of where I've come from and where I'm sort of aiming for in the future, really. So I'll just I'll fire away, and uh, this story is sort of chronological. So, um, yeah, let's hold on a minute. Let me just, this is, here we go. So this is where I come from. It's a little bit down the road, but uh, you see the little surfer in the bottom right here. This is the North Sea, one of the spots we love to surf. You can see it's, uh, there's no palm trees, there's no lifeguards, it's pretty bleak, and there's huge waves smashing over seawalls and lighthouses. Um, which we really love to surf. Um, here's a little example. So that's one of the sort of nice stormy days that we surf in the North Sea. The water's pretty brown. Um, it's not a surfing mecca by any means. We do have stand-up paddlers in the ocean up here. Um, but, you know, it's a really tight-knit community and we, and we really do love it up here. And this was the era, surfing in 1989. So I was a young little 10-year-old, uh, excitable little surf grom. And this is what the surfing world looked like to me in 1989. The magazines were full of bright colours and neon wetsuits. And this like phenomenal world that we looked at, this sort of neon world. All the brands were alive and it was a like, real counterculture to what the surfing was like in the North Sea, in, in uh, where, where I grew up, which looked a little bit more like this. It's very industrial. The water's brown. And this was the reality for this sort of Northeast surfing community. We're literally surfing in front of like, that's a super tanker behind this guy surfing here. We had our heroes. This is a guy called Veach, who was really instrumental in Northeast surfing, you know, a real pioneer of like UK British pro surfing. And he was my like, real idol growing up and to, the, to my brothers. I've got two brothers, uh, younger and older. And Veach really sort of drove this sort of secret counterculture community and made us dream and think really big. And we were part of this as another really close friend and a real um, instrumental person in the time of the community, a guy called Stephen Hudson, who started off Time Health Surf Co with his friends. And this is like 
the real bare bones of the hub of um, northeast surfing. You know, there's these little hot spots. So I'm based up in Tynemouth, which is near Newcastle. Then there's a little um, town called Saltburn. It's got a surf community. And then down in Scarborough, there's another surf community. So it's a real sort of backwater of British surfing, never mind of like global surfing. But we do have fantastic waves on the right day. So I grew up really in love with this environment and also in love with the community. And that really sort of drew, just sort of sparked this energy when I was a young sort of 10, 12 year old surfer and because you're stepping into this whole new world. But you know, as, as ever with life, you have these real highs and the real lows. And then uh, the picture here that you see is this ring of surfers and the gathering on the beach. This is around, um, this is all a really symbolic paddle out when we've lost one of these really influential surfers. And um, there's probably been too many of these paddle outs and they're really emotional and sort of sparks the community and brings the community together. And we use it to like really remember people. Um, so this is like, suddenly you're in this tribe of people that normally you wouldn't, you know, if, you, if you're on the land looking out to sea, you maybe don't see this world. But if, as you guys watching and probably, you know, you're paddling or you're surfing, it doesn't matter. You've got this real connection with the water and your community. And this is my little posse of friends and we grew up in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And this was this crazy action that we were doing these like terrible turns and terrible wetsuits. But this was like what we were really passionate about. So one thing to remember as I go through this presentation is like this paddle out and paddle outs like this become really quite important um, actually in our lives. Um, so let's bear that in mind. I'm going to come back to that later on. So but at the same time, so I'm busy try, trying to learn to surf. And then I met these guys. These are Surfers Against Sewage, who you mentioned, Chris. And again, this is in 1989. And um, I met these guys on the beach um, in Hartlepool. And they were campaigning against raw sewage outflows. So it's hard to think now that, I mean, we still do get like raw sewage in the water, usually after storms. But back in like the late 80s, early 90s, with, it was a serious problem and we're so lucky now for the work that Surfers Against Sewage has done. But these guys were my heroes. This photo is actually in Guernsey. And um, Jersey and Guernsey at the time, Jersey had just had a UV filtration system put on the end of their sewage pipe. So Surfers Against Sewage literally the guy Chris Hines at the time he, he was so confident in the water quality coming out of the sewage pipe because of the UV treatment he said he would literally stick his head under the sewage pipe as it like let out the effluent and it would be clean enough to surf you know to surf in whereas on the neighboring island of Guernsey where this photo was taken they hadn't put in that UV system so I think Jersey and Guernsey have this sort of rivalry and these guys like rocked up at Guernsey and said, your neighbors in Jersey have got UV treatment. The water's good, the water's clear. This is how you should like get rid of your sewage. So these guys are like super activist. And this is like going back, you know, going back is that nearly like, you know, over 30 years, these guys have been activism, you know, key activists in that whole time. And they're really effective. So the point on the bottom left here where I say the privatization of war companies allowed SES to become shareholders at AGMs. This is again, super important to remember. But basically it meant all the war companies were getting sold off. And um, it meant that a shareholder, so someone from SAS could buy a, um, a share in the company and then go to the AGM and then sort of within the AGM or heckle the shareholders of the company and say, guys, like I'm part of this company and you're, what we flushed down the toilets going in the sea. So this is like the way the SAS were thinking at the time. It's, it was really ahead of its time. And again, we're going to come back to that uh, later on. And um, no, no clues as to guessing what's in the middle of this picture. Basically, it's a big brown inflatable turd. And uh, another like, classic service against sewage um, sort of campaign sort of tactic at the time was to do these like super visual um, it rock up. This is actually outside Strasbourg, the EU Parliament at the time, and they rock up with the, the turd and they're demanding like EU legislation. And then this one here is um, outside in Brighton, outside the uh, Labour Party conference, I believe. And again, you know, straight to Parliament, straight to the MPs, really demanding like change at the highest level. So while SAS are like charging around with gas masks on and um, 
inflatable turds. I was this young, we've moved forward a few years now, it's um, age 15 and I want to be a pro surfer and I'm my first ever like sponsor, the guys at Second Skin, these awesome wetsuits we used to love and wave graffiti, these like fantastic boards of the my early 90s and I, I literally wanted to be a surf star, follow my idols, um, Veach and the like and travel the world and be a surf star. Which coming from Newcastle is pretty off the wall sort of concept. But luckily I had very supportive parents who um, and brothers that pushed us and we were part of this sort of young generation of um, really keen groms. Um, so here we go, we fast forward in the 90s and you know things are really happening. I've got a surfboard that's full of sponsors. I've got um, this action everywhere. We're traveling the world, we're in warm water, it's all left home, charging around. I've seen these beautiful, wonderful places. This is the Bahamas on a trip with a, for a surf magazine. You know, these environmental things, you're just getting um, like swallowed up by the ocean and you know, traveling all the oceans of the world, literally living the dream, seeing the environment, the most pristine world that you could possibly imagine coming from that sort of dirty, nitty gritty zone in the Northeast of England. So again, it's just like full connection with the environment. And again, um, at home I had the community of uh, the local surfers, but when you're traveling the world and you're part of these spons you know, sponsors and part of the surf industry, you're right in amongst it and you're this band of like pro surfers pushing each other and um, working, for the, working for the surf companies and working for the magazines and going into competitions, doing all these things, you know, to put your name up there and charge up the ranks. Um, so again, it's like community and it's environment. And then meanwhile, Far more important than our surf industry stuff is surf skin sewage is still like powering on. This is um, this is the team at Surf Against Sewage going to the number ten Downing Street. Obviously, it's my wife there with the scarf on. It's Hugo and Andy who were running Surf Against Sewage at the time, and uh, Ben Howard, a, a good musician who's there to support, who's got real good connections with my brother, a fantastic musician, and then the guy on the right is an MP. I'm guessing for new key, but you know, MPs sort of come and go. They have a pretty tough time to themselves really. And we give them a tough time and so we should. So I can't remember the name of this MP, but I'm sure he's not <laughs> with us anymore. And um, what you do learn about going through this process of SAS, like going to the highest levels, going to parliament, making change at like um, system change, you know, you've really got to get political. You've got to work with your MPs. You've got to vote people in. You've got to get people on side. And you've really got to like, you know, go after these people to make change because they're the guys that make the law, the guys and girls that make the laws that we, you know, that, that we sort of have to live with as we know in this crazy year that we're having right now. So this is like, this is the big stuff here. But um, obviously, you know, we're in the 2000s and the surf industry is this mega boom. And um, as Chris sort of mentioned in the intro, um, I started surfing these bigger waves and this is pioneering waves in Ireland. This is out uh, sort of towards Donegal and the waves just get bigger and bigger. And um, I'm surfing these waves with my friends and you know, things are pretty incredible. These are waves that you um, really wouldn't want to fall off on because there's serious consequences at this sort of size. Um, and this really was the peak of my surfing. I did, you know, I was, I was never really the best surfer. I'd, I'd go down to Cornwall and, you know, I'd win English national championships and I'd become British champion, but I was never the best, best surfer. I'd make sort of headway in the Europeans and I'd get top 10 here and there, you know, like sort of tapping on the door of the world circuit and stuff, competing internationally. But uh, this, these sort of sessions and these sort of waves were really pioneering and really made headlines in the world. Um, my wife helped... Gabe, can I just ask a question a minute? Yeah, go for it. Um, sorry to interrupt you in full flow, but I'm, I'm just curious. Um, were you using jet skis as towing back in the day with this? Or yeah, you, you were. Totally. Like so, these waves, both these waves here, are, are tow surfer. Uh, like so, jet ski assist. So basically, the jet ski for the guys and girls that don't maybe don't know it. You partner up with a guy. The guy that I always surf with here was a guy called Richie Fitzgerald, who um, lives in Bundoran in Northwest Ireland, um, we were really tight. We put in a lot of time at this spot and these waves don't come around very often. Um, so you've got to be ready to go and you've got to be fully kitted up. Um, so you need your jet ski, you need specific surfboards. The surfboards are way down in lead. You need life jackets. And we were literally going out sort of into the unknown with just a handful of other 
keen guys and girls. Um, the jet ski is there to, to help you catch the wave because you can't really paddle it with just arm power. And the jet ski is there also as a safety device. So we're talking about like water skills, like the skills of water pick up and drop off in that wave zone with the jet ski in between these waves is like life and death critical. Um, but the waves that you're seeing here and now guys, it's progressed again in the last few years where guys are actually paddling the, these waves without jet skis. So it's gone to another level again. And uh, question for you, Kate. Um, guess who it's come from? One guess. <laughs> well, it's got to be a Gordon Ingram. <laughs> it's a Gordon question. Has the ski ever broken down? Is there a story there? <laughs> this, so yeah. Don't try to bypass that one. Um, but, you know, joking um, aside, these things do happen though, don't they? We, yeah, I mean, it's really, you're literally on the edge of, um, you know, the North Atlantic storms. And I think this wave on the right was one of the biggest storms about one of the sort of biggest depressions, like low pressure systems for about 10 years. And we managed to get uh, one morning where the wind was favorable, the tide is favorable before the, it shoot, you know, the biggest Atlantic storm hits. So these moments are really tight moments in time when you, you don't just rock up and find these waves, like you've got to be on the ball ready to go. And the prep to get into that, so sh exactly as Gordon said, we have had you know, pretty much disasters where the ski's broken down. Um, little things like we were surfing under the cliffs of Moa in the west of Ireland, where, and um, we weren't actually in the waves and we were just beyond the waves and um, just idling between catching waves. and. Um, a tiny fishing thread, like a fishing line that's come off someone's like, you know, fishing rod, basically got caught around the impeller, seized the engine, and all of a sudden we're about three miles away from the nearest harbour, completely surrounded by vertical cliffs, hundreds of feet high, with massive waves coming, and the engine is dead, because basically some like bit of sort of sea debris has got sucked into the impeller of the jet ski, and all of a sudden, like, it's ultra critical and there's really not much you can do. You're at the mercy of the conditions. But then um, we were fortunate enough that we had a, a second jet ski out there that towed us back to shore. But, you know, you imagine any of these slight things go wrong, they go really badly wrong. I was going to say, Gabe, uh, I guess that's where you discovered that adrenaline is brown. Um, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you managed to get a tow, so thank goodness for that. It's, but it's like, it's really tricky. And the guys, the guys and girls now are pushing, you know, you see the waves in Portugal and the waves are so dangerous, but the safety level's gone up and there is a lot more training involved. There's a lot better safety equipment involved. Um, but yeah, there's like, you're rolling the dice amongst these conditions. So um, that's, that's, you know, every bit of training that you guys do, for example, you know, everyone in your basic CPR or, you know, what safety equipment, who to call, where to go, safety in and now what like your entry and exit of the water like all those points it's the same thing whether you're just learning to surf in two foot waves as it is when it's like 50 foot waves um you, it's the same you need exactly the same thing that's just maybe the consequences uh yeah i i, go up. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you too much on your flow there um, but Declan sent in a question gabe and I, i'll try and um fire these through uh, as yeah. the questions come in but um uh, Declan's asking what's was, was the Irish tow and rescue um, crew active when you and Richie were pioneering aliens? Had, had they formed in that back then? No, no, um, not really. We were, um, myself and Richie were probably literally, uh, basically the Malloy, if there's any surfers there, the, the surfers amongst us will know that the Malloy brothers were probably the first sort of surfers to really take on Mullock Moor. We were sort of next in line. So, so the Malloy brothers were Americans that came over who'd surfed in Hawaii around the world. And um, they saw the waves in Ireland and sort of lit the fuse and said, these waves are as good as anywhere in the world, but you just got to sort of figure out how to ride them. So we were the local guys, you know, I'm saying I'm a local to Ireland, but I was sort of there long enough to become like one of the pioneers out here. And then we sort of helped the sort of Irish community really sort of, um, you know, to, get learn the potential of their own waves i guess and that then goes across europe you know there's crews in france doing the same thing and portugal doing the same thing and the irish um tow surf rescue crew 
came a couple of years later and they're really, really good. There's paramedics, there's fire crew, there's safety crew, they're connected with the Coast Guard, they're RNLI trained, they're like top, top level safety crew and they basically became like self, self-supporting, I guess you'd say it. And then there's um, at, at the break that I was talking about where we, our ski died because of fishing line under the cliffs there, they've now put in safety boxes, so big pelly cases, full of safety devices so if you do get washed in under the cliffs and the helicopter can't come and get you there's basically like stashed on the rocks at two or three of the surf spots there's like little survival packs of food drink radio blankets first aid kits so basically you if you got washed in under the cliffs and the helicopter can't get you overnight and you've got to basically paddle yourself out the next day there's like a survival pack under the cliffs and the irish tow surf rescue have and they you know really they do like annual training. They're really, really good. And the international version of that is called the Big Wave Risk Assessment Group. It's like a brag course. So if anyone really wants this sort of big wave knowledge, there's the Irish Surf Rescue Crew or the Brag course who are actually doing an online tutorial this, um, coming up this winter. So there's a couple of big wave, if there are any big wave surfers amongst you or people who want to go in that direction, there are a couple of like resources there to, to take your skills further which we can like forward on, you know, to anyone that's interested. Okay, so, so thanks for that, Gabe. Like, um, so moving on from Ireland then, um, where, where, where did it take you after you visited, visited the Irish coastline surf and those massive waves? Um, well, I'll keep, I'll keep rolling through and um, here, I'll tell you where this was. Uh, if you want to see these waves in, in action, there's a film called Wave Riders, which um, my wife helped uh, write. Oh, my wife wrote it and um, that went on to win loads of awards. It's probably on, I'm not on Netflix, it's, it's on somewhere or other. You can buy our DVDs if anyone's got DVD plays anymore. So this is like a really nice story and ends in one of these huge sessions. Um, and again, this is another example, like, you know, the whole world started to take notice of these, these big waves happening in Europe. Um, and so now you get these like in Hawaiian surfers coming over to Europe or coming to Portugal to surf the European waves. Um, so this is kind of like the peak of my sort of surfing where I really, really like, ex that was my sort of speciality and I absolutely loved it. And then something even more Im impressive happened. Uh, this guy came along. So he's our little son. So you imagine when this guy came along, um, things take a little, even more exciting turn. And, uh, the next generation comes in and, um, I actually broke my leg really badly. So I kind of like put the big, really big wave surfing on hold and um, yeah, I saw this life change a little bit later on. And this is a little video of, of where we're at right now. So you imagine this is the next generation. So this is where um, the surf stoke is now, little one foot waves, totally awesome. Probably as happy on this one foot wave than I was ever on a 50 foot wave. And uh, that's, awesome. that's really cool, isn't it? Wow. So, you know, it doesn't, have to be, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a big wave to be an exciting wave. And then the next part of my life sort of kicked in at this point. Um, so we've got a young son. Um, I don't know if any of the guys and girls listening have read this book. It really is a good read, especially if you're in any way like business or environmental or run your own business. This is this is a must read book and I'd read this book. And basically this is, once you've read this book, you really just want to like, you know, get as close to Patagonia ethos as you can. And you sort of mentioned the things that you've done, Chris, that sort of helped drive your business in this direction. So let my people go surfing. It's Yvonne Chouinard, who's the owner of Patagonia. He started off as a blacksmith climber and he'd make um, clean climbing. So the little chocks that you put in the, in the cliff as you go up there, climbing um this is a, and then from there he started the clothing company and um so here we are this is sort of here and now so i've been working for patagonia for five years and this was their mission statement up until just a couple of years ago so what yvonne chouinard sort of led into the company was he had to build the best product so if it's a, it needs to be the best waterproof jacket the best winter coat the best wetsuit, the best fly fishing gear. And then 
the next line of the mission statement is don't co uh, cause no unnecessary harm. So if you're making the best jacket, it's got to be the, it's got to last the longest. It's got to be repairable. It's got to be like ethically sourced. And then the last bit here is use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. It's a little bit wordy, but basically it means if Patagonia can do it and do it well, everyone else, you know, there's not really any excuses for another clothing company not to do the same thing because if it works for Patagonia, it can work for anyone. They're sort of leading the way on all these things. So we get to put these, uh, you know, murals up on walls and, um, you know, it's how we sort of deliver this message as best we can. And this is going, um, this is one of the sort of iconic adverts advert ran in the New York Times on Black Friday. You know, the, the day of the year when everything's on sales, probably like Amazon Prime Day or whatever, and the whole world's buying, going, buying crazy. Patagonia basically put an advert in the New York Times and said, don't buy the jacket. You don't need it. Don't buy it. Or if you do buy it, buy the best one that you can possibly buy so it lasts longer. It's telling you to reduce what you buy, repair what you've got, reuse if you can and recycle if you can't. Um, interestingly enough, obviously, this they put the ad in the paper telling you not to buy it and the sales of the jacket sort of went through the roof as kind of not exactly what we had in mind, but that's kind of what happened that the message sort of lives true. And then this is a cotton farm. Um, so when we're going down to like build the breast product, it was like everything, a simple t-shirt can be an organic cotton t-shirt or a sort of industrial cotton t-shirt. And the difference of the two farms of a sort of high intensity, highly chemical sourced cotton or organic cotton is just mind blowing apparently. You know, there's, there's bees and there's bugs and there's insects flying around this field, whereas, um, an industrial cotton farm is just dead of any other creatures. So everything we make is 100% organic cotton. The fleece of, um, you know, fleece is recycled. This is going back like decades. This is in the 90s. The fleece was recycled way before my time in Patagonia. This is um, down. So you, you down for our jacket, you know, the insulation jackets. So it was down feather jackets. Basically, we use... Um, traceable or in this case recycled down so old duvets that you'd think it end up in the bin or whatever they basically cut out the feathers they clean the feathers and that's all of our sportswear jackets are now made using recycled down so these are massive like we call them franchise products you know the best selling fleece the best selling like down jackets we all wear the puffer jackets these are massive really like million dollar styles of product and they're taken um recycled or um you know more sustainable sourcing to get your product the most recent product we've got is this cap here if you see underneath the cap there's the fishing net so that's a um, nylon fishing net from south america and then if you look under the cap here at the bottom the sort of peak of the cap where the cotton's pulled away so this company boreo um puts a value on waste fishing nets takes it from the fishermen gives them a payment and that every single cap that we make now has this um, recycled fishing net component in the peak of the cap. And we're gonna get more and more products from these guys, Boreo, um, who, are, who were surfers who started this um, sourcing of plastic products. So it's just back to back, like phenomenal stories on every product. You think it's a simple product, but every product that we make has an incredible story behind it. And it's there for a reason. Um, we're going a bit more Patagonia here. This is the updated mission statement. So where we, where we originally said, um, build the best product, cause no unnecessary, har unnecessary harm. Yvonne Schoenard, the owner, who's getting older, he's getting more and more impatient. He's not seen a, the rest of the, the world come on board. You know, the rest of the fashion industry is not going recycled. You know, organic cotton is not getting used. I think 3% of all cotton is organic. Like it's not like, brands just aren't jumping on board you know that people are only just realizing you can get recycled polyester products it's like we've been doing it for since the 90s okay okay why just sorry to interrupt you yeah why do you think it is that brands are not embracing this um, environmental message more more than they actually are given that you know it, everyone is becoming a lot more aware of this consumers are probably demanding this now so do you think if brands do not embrace that philosophy, it could be the end of that brand eventually? Um, there's, I guess, the problem is if I go back a couple of slides, like these guys, like that fleece top left, it's, yeah. 
it's um, yeah, recycled plastic bottles. They've been doing that literally for decades. But so it's saving raw like petrochemical materials, but there's a bit more cost involved in that than if you use virgin raw materials. So basically, it comes down to fast fast fashion, like high street fashion, um, brands cutting corners, brands um, bottom line. Yeah. So you're paying a little bit more for your product because if you're using a, a t-shirt that's organic cotton, it's fair trade certified, um, you know, dyed correct, you know, the dyeing process can be really like energy, energy inefficient and water resource heavy. So um, the dyeing process has a massive environmental footprint. Uh, the denim jeans, like stuff like that, they're really toxic chemicals, high use of water, high energy. It's dirty and it's cheap. And most consumers want the cheap product. I mean, who, who doesn't want the cheap product? But that product comes with another cost that the brands aren't really telling you what that cost is. Mm. And that to me is probably the problem. And, and am, I, am I correct in saying that um, one, of the, one of the big selling points with the Patagonia ethos was this lifetime guarantee or a, a, if your product has a fault, send it back and we will repair it. Or if we cannot repair it, we'll um, replace it. Is, is yeah. that right? And I mean, that's a that's an amazing statement to make, isn't it? It's an amazing service for any company to it's, offer. It's pretty phenom phenomenal. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, there's really good stories of like products that you know lasted the test of time. They get sent back, and we'll try and we'll try really try our best to like repair a product or replace it. Or you know, if it's a zipper gone, if if the jacket, we can give a jacket an extra season or two like yeah. we really want that product to last longer it's a bit more difficult with wetsuits so i'm going to put like disclaimer on that if you think <laughs> buying a wetsuit <laughs> no. like, it's, it's like wear and tear um you know it's like we've got to be realistic about the lifetime of a product but there's some like really cool stories about um there was one uh one cool story actually it was came from the uk about a guy that bought like a patagonia uh like kayak is sort of wet i don't know what you call them like a kayak um sort of wet dry top thing with like dry yeah, yeah. dry suit um cuffs on it yeah and they, they called us up to repair it and nobody in europe even knew the product or when it was sold until we were going back in time like 20 or 30 years and we couldn't even find the product in any of the product like libraries and basically bought it like 30 years ago <laughs> and we managed to source so i had to go send it off to the american archive to like say hey, what's this product where do you get the bits from to try and repair it and then sure enough the the actual um like seal for the neck that needed replacing was made by a company in the uk so we got it repaired for him <laughs> in uk actually the guys at bodyline awesome. and we re repaired this guy's like kayak top that we didn't even know that we ever made <laughs> it's like, <totally> classic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, there's some amazing stories like that. I've actually um, listened to the book, uh, uh, Evon's book, um, on audiobooks, and um, I, I can't recommend it enough. The, the book that you mentioned earlier, um, so Let My People Go Surfing, that, that's the title. If, if any of you guys want to either buy the book, it is available on um, as an audiobook as well, and it really is inspirational. So, yeah, thanks for that. Go oh. to interrupt you again mid -flow. That's all right. <laughs> right, I'll fire through. Um, so this is a classic of Von Schoenard quote, you know, to do good, you have to do something. Like, you can't just sit there and say, hey, it's going to be great, everything's going to be fine. Or you can't be the guy or girl that says, like, um, you know, this, I'm too small, I can't do anything. You've got to do something. And so it's a, my role right now is, like, um, how, do we, how does the, the European business, or the surf category in particular, so I'm the surf category manager for Europe, so I, I run like the surf side of Patagonia in Europe. So, so we're in business to save our own planet is the mission statement of the company. And I've got to bring that down to like the community level within the UK and within Europe. So this is a surf shop in UK. So um, we, we painted this mural on the wall um, to launch our fair trade products um, on the wall of the surf shop. So it's like, how do we engage our community and this is a classic example of what you pretty much just talking about there, Chris. It's the Warnwear Surf Tour. So we had this little trailer that goes on the back of a four wheel drive and it uh, drove around three countries. We stopped 23 different times with um, four different wetsuit repair. This is Elsie and the top, uh, top of the screen. She's a fantastic seamstress of wetsuits. Um, so four wetsuit repair techs. 
and we repaired over 14 wetsuits, 400 wetsuits. This is any brand, not just Patagonia, like all brands and additional items of clothing. So we're like going out there saying like, guys, repair your product if you can. Um, and this is a full like ethos of the brand. And we did this to launch um, fair trade wetsuits, which I'm going to come to in a minute. So this is like, we're just kind of get out in the community and, um, you know, repair what you've got is the best, best way to like reduce the footprint of your product. This is LC like, hands-on in the back of the truck repairing suits um they did a phenomenal job it was awesome and another way like how we're in business to save our own planet is how we're going to disrupt the industry so we're doing that ourselves almost like you said chris it's like if patagonia can do it why can't anyone else do we like push them do we pull them is it like to the consumer to sort of lead on that it's like how do we sort of get up get people to make the change and in this case, we're talking about wetsuits here. And wetsuits to me is, for all of us probably listening, we've all got wetsuits. We've got wetsuits in the garage. Basically, all wetsuits will either be petrochemical made from oil, limestone-based, where you're literally digging limestone out of a quarry. Then you're melting the limestone to about two to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, literally melting stones into a liquid, which then gets made into a wetsuit or Patagonia have um, worked with a company called Ulex to get natural rubber from trees, sustainably sourced FCS certified trees, and the um, sort of latex sap that comes out of the tree can become the largest component of your wetsuit. So these are the three choices of your wetsuit that we all have. And, you know, fossil fuels, non-sustainable limestone, or sustainable Ulex natural rubber, which um, from our calculations is saves an 80% CO2 saving compared to the other two. So I think we've got a little video here, which explains that process on wetsuit. Oh, ooh, didn't that work? Oh, here we go. I'm gonna have to click. Well, it's, it's as big a leap as they made in neoprene over 50 years, 60 years, and it's happening in five. Wetsuits out of plants, like really? Yeah, nothing worthwhile is easy. 200 material trials. Supply chain evaporated. Okay, we're going all in. Consistencies. Pure profiles. Moody viscosity. Content. Lab tests. Finally reach a point where, whoa, like, wow. Something's changed here and, and we've actually, we've actually figured something out. The history of Ulex um, for Patagonia started 10 years ago. 200 material trials to get to something that could be built into a wetsuit and put in the water. Ulex found that if they actually put latex from the Havea tree through their process, they got an equally high-performing product than just neoprene. And the wetsuit's finished is actually releasing 80% less CO2 into the atmosphere than a traditional wetsuit. Everything's FSC certified. That FSC means there is no clear cutting. The workers that are harvesting the rubber have access to daycare, medical, you know, all these things that FSC ensures. And then this year we're bringing forth fair trade at the factory. You know, it'll be the world's first fair trade certified wetsuit and taking care of the people who are producing our products that we love. This year, we really wanted to focus on the performance. Working with the factory to really stabilize the material itself and make it stretch a lot better. You know, you can run as many lab tests as you want on the stretch, but you know, every surfer knows until you get into that suit, you know, that's when you know, you just feel it right away. Tons of other improvements that really just go unnoticed. These small, minute changes really just complementing the experience. Actually, that's what that, you should take that. I can get excited about performance and, and stretch and design all day long, but at the end of the day, this isn't some proprietary thing we keep to ourselves. This is something that we open up to the whole world, really. That's the end goal, you know, changing the supply chain for everyone. And, and making you know, this the new world.
played for you guys all right. I know it might be a bit weird doing um, videos on Zoom, but um, I hope that's, that's fine. Absolutely. Was that okay? Yeah, it worked brilliantly. For, well, it did for me. I hope it did for all you guys and girls as well. But Brilliant, thank you. So yeah, just to, I mean, I'll fly through some of this stuff. So basically these are the trees where each tree um, gets cut every morning and the sap comes down and, and that latex sits in the pot, which gets um, this drip here. It's probably about a litre per pot, which we think is about that much or thereabouts for every wetsuit. So you imagine every tree, every morning gets cut. The tree lifespan is about 35 years. At the end of the tree's life, you know, you can plant a new tree. Um, from the saplings and the wood gets reused. So that's the, the source of the largest ingredient of the wetsuit. And this is um, Belinda Baggs and her son Rayson. And this is the, um, from it goes from that sappy liquid into this sort of rubber, um, kind of like a sticky rubber uh, latex, which then gets shipped over to, uh, so this is uh, the trees of the forest are in Sri Lanka that we use. And on the left here now, this is called, they call this the mother bun. <laughs> okay. So this is um, really thick sheets of Ulex, or you would normally call it neoprene, but neoprene's from either limestone or oil, if you remember, but this is from the um, trees. So this large, thick mother bun of uh, Ulex foam, it's basically then sliced up into if you want a two millimeter, three millimeter, five millimeter, you get slices out of this, which then become um, the central part of this foam in our wetsuit. And then the either side of the foam is sandwiched with a recycled polyester on the bottom that grids inside you, sits against your skin, and then the outside is uh, you know another recycled layer. And then you know you get into that the final tweaks and design of your suit. And as it said in the video, so our suits are Fairtrade certified. So um, as you get Fairtrade coffee, Fairtrade bananas, what Patagonia has done is Fairtrade certify the Shaco factory. The Shaco factory is where about 90% of the wetsuits get made in the world. Of the surfing wetsuit, of the high performance wetsuits, pretty much all get made at the Shaco factory bar, maybe one brand. Once Patagonia has Fair Trade certified the factory, it's done all the checks, you know, all the labor, um, you know, whatever, environmental checks and sort of employment checks are there. It means that we pay the extra premium, which is about 1% of the cost of our wetsuits at factory level. And that percentage goes directly to, this, to the skilled workers who work on the suits. Once we Fairtrade certified the whole factory, any other brand using that factory can choose to pay the Fairtrade premium or not. So you've got to think of it, every single, well, we're going to say about 90% of the brands use the factory. Every single brand that uses the factory knows about the Fairtrade certification. It knows about Ulex rubber foam. And most of them, like 90% of those, do not use either of these so they're not helping the workers and they're not helping the environment and they're not helping. You imagine if all the brands come on board with this, it's going to lower the price. Yeah. So you've really got to think about like who you're buying your suits from and the cost of your suit and um, like who, you know, where that money goes to. Uh, that's, that's shocking, isn't it? Um, Sarah, you've, your, um, your statement as well. It's, it, that's, I never knew that game. It's, it's eye watering. And then, so when you suddenly like going from where I was like that keen surfer with all the sticks on the boards where you love the surf industry for all the best bits in the world. Yeah. And then you look at them like cutting costs and cutting corners. And there's always a cost with that. And then with wetsuits, it gets way worse than that. So Patagonia went on this journey with Ulex to find like, we knew the wetsuits were in green. So it was like, how do you improve the footprint of the wetsuit? Like we did with the fleeces and the t-shirt. And this, you know, we've, We've, it's not the perfect wetsuit. We're not saying it's you can't recycle it. It's not like a biodegradable wetsuit, but it's as good as we can get it right now, and we're continuing to improve it. So we did it for environmental reasons, but um, basically the alternative of a neoprene wetsuit comes from this factory in the Louisiana uh, Louisiana Valley um, state, 
of America. So around the factory that makes chloroprene, which is neoprene, so this factory makes neoprene, and around the neoprene factory is the highest cancer um, cluster in the whole of America. Wow. So, and again, this has been on all the news channels. The Guardian has done this phenomenal report on it, uh, a year-long report on this. They call it Cancer Rally. It's brutal. And neoprene is in a lot of products. It's in, you know, we use it for wetsuits. So it's, you know, it's less than 10% of this factory is used for, like, leisure products, which would be, a, you know, it's a thin slice of the pie is going to be a wetsuit. You use it in cars. You use it in shoes. Like, neoprene is in a lot of different things. Um, and this factory is basically a cancer cluster factory. It's absolutely brutal. So this story hasn't really come out in the surfing press, but we're trying to like get this message out there that neoprene is really bad for the environment. And it's actually got this human cost, which is, a, I mean, it's eye war. And once you go in the story, it's really, really heartbreaking. So this is, um, you know, I, I can go on with this. It's, I get quite passionate about this, so I'll better move on. <laughs> So um, this is, I'm trying to, I want to finish on a positive. So this is surf activism. So we're in business to save our home planet. How are surfers and, you know, water users, stand-up paddlers, bodyboarders, I'm saying surf activism because I'm a surfer, but it could be anything. How do we like make change and positive change? This one, um, we're back to America here, but this was a win. This was a beach in um, County Clare called Dogmore Beach, where Donald Trump has a golf course and the sea was starting to like eat away at the sand dunes and Donald Trump wanted to build a like two or three kilometer long seawall on this super, um, what's the word, like a sand dune, like really sort of delicate sand dune ecosystem. And um, Patagonia and the Patagonia ambassadors work with Save the Waves and the local community to really put pressure on um, the local council to block the seawall construction and say, to be honest, you should move the golf course back a few hundred yards rather than trying to put a seawall up, which only like, you know, creates more problems further down the coast at the end of the seawall. So this was one campaign where surfers really stood up and got involved. And the next one I want to talk about was this one, the fight for the bite campaign. So this, I don't know if the guys or girls watched before the, before our chat tonight, the um, Nevertown screening. So this was a, a campaign that's come from the Australian surf crew, obviously. And um, you see that oil spill um, visual below Australia. This was used from the model from an oil company called Equinor. So Equinor, a Norwegian-based oil company, and they wanted to drill in this great Australian bite, the south coast of Australia, which you're looking at thousands of miles of coastline. Um, hot, you know, put a map, a map of the UK in there, and we're tiny. Um, so the risks of drilling in this zone, super high risk, and the Australian surfers, and particularly the Patagonia ambassadors in that region, were, um, you know, we're not having it. It's just unacceptable. You know, it's fossil fuel, climate change, drilling. The risks are just phenomenal. So we did a lot of work on trying to supporting the sort of activists around the um, indigenous peoples there, that and it's um migration route for whales it's like super um you know it's one-off ecosystem on the world it's a phenomenal area and it was at risk so how do we stop these oil this oil drilling in this zone and we come back to community and we were talking about community paddle outs and suddenly the australian surfers who are um normally quite a laid back bunch went all out they couldn't believe that a norwegian company was coming to australia threatening their coastline and largely taking the profits out of the country. So the surfers started really standing up to this around the entire coastline. So we're talking thousands of surfers, hundreds of paddle outs, weekend after weekend, beach after beach. And um, so my role was like, how do we help the Australian guys? Equinor, the company wanting to drill, is a Norwegian company, so it's sort of in our neighborhood. So it's like, how do we get... Um, what action can we take in Europe? And basically Heath, the guy in the middle here, he's the surfer closest, he's got the most to lose. He lives right there. So Heath came over to Norway and this is in the harbor of Oslo. And suddenly we got all the Norwegian surfers to give us their support. So here's Heath shouting and screaming in a paddle out on the doorstep of Equinor. So we're taking actions. We've got the community moment, the community's mobilized, we've got action. 
And here we go. So this is the middle of Oslo and all these local surfers and paddlers are saying, you know, this Norwegian largely state owned oil company is not really doing the right thing. So we took even more action. We joined with uh, Extinction Rebellion, you know, the pretty controversial group. This was us outside the headquarters in Oslo doing it. This was like 9 a.m. when everyone, or 8 a.m. when everyone's going to work, they had to like walk over us to get in the front door. So we were sort of playing dead there for half an hour. And better than that, um, if you go back to remember the surface against sewage um, moment in time where uh, the water companies, they bought shares in the water company so they could go to the AGM. Basically, um, this is Heath in the middle here. Heath and myself, and this is one of my colleagues, Lisa, bought shares in the company of Equinor. So we could then go to the AGM, and this is Heath in the uh, shirt here, handing over to the guy on the left, the CEO of Equinor, a thousand uh, petition of letters from all of the community of his area, the fishing community, um, the tourism community. And um, that's myself and Lisa on the right and on the left, on the screen on the right. Um, and we took out a full page advert in the local newspaper saying Equinor is not welcome. And alongside us were like Greenpeace, WWF, Indigenous Peoples. So the whole AGM was around this issue. So they're trying to tell the shareholders like we're doing great. We've bought five new windmills. We're super rico. And we're saying, no, you guys are tripping. You're like drilling for fossil fuels in a super protected area. And this is an example. So this was the newspaper um, advert that we took out and basically me, myself and Lisa snuck in between the meetings there was a we went into all the toilets and all the desks in the office and we littered the entire office with the newspaper advert that we just printed in the local newspaper and um, that's Lisa in the ladies toilets there and my little like selfie snap in the top right of me in the gents toilets and we just literally stacked papers everywhere they went so the whole AGM was around this issue and like I said this is basically using the exact same tactics that surfs against sewage used to get the water companies to clean up their act basically it's shareholder power bit by bit we have more and more power to change the way these companies act if we take it to their doorstep if you say nothing and if you do nothing and you don't act they'll just carry on making money at all costs so it's how do you get your message where it really counts like system change not just like you know we all want to clean the beach and we you know we all want to tie up the beach and this and that but that's not really stopping the tide of plastic it's like how do you really stop the tide of tide of like how do you really change business and this is a little clip i don't know how long we've got left here but we're pretty much this is um a little recap video of this is heath um in norway so this is a little recap of that whole moment in time which um ended up really positive but i like this is about a five minute clip and basically at the end of this we can do any questions chris if guys are still with us and um the outcome of this since we made the film is basically equinor have now pulled out of drilling in the great australian bight and um all basically all of the other major oil companies are also out of the zone as well but this is another little clip where I never thought I'd be up in the Arctic Circle in Norway. I never thought I'd be going to a gigantic oil company's AGM. I never thought I'd you know, be protesting for my kids' future, for our future, and just for the future of all of us. I'm going to get in the water, go for my first surf in Norway. Time to get a couple of one foot dribblers. First impressions is just mind explosion. This place is insane. I made the connection that this is so different to the bite, but it's also so similar. 
it gets you know, smashed in the in the winter with tons of snow and, and big storms and you see it in the landscape like it's a rugged landscape now, I, I wasn't aware that they've been fighting this for so long up here like i think it's been like 15 years or something they've had small wins over that time where they've had you know they've said all right lufferton's off limits for three to four years but they know once that period's up you know equinor's going to be pushing as hard as they can to get back in there again it was never like shut down until now the value of this as it is, it's, it's so much, so much more than, than any oil money, you know. People have lived here for thousands of years because of this. It's, it's possible to uh, make a living here and, and, and keep living here for thousands of years if we just uh, look after the environment. Yeah, he's, um, you can feel his really heartfelt support for what we're going through in Australia and he's really committed to helping wherever he can. It's exactly the same. I think we're fight, fighting same battle. Mm, for sure. We all know if a spill happens, it's going to destroy fisheries, it's going to destroy you know, marine ecosystems and destroy our playgrounds. But the things they were focusing on is just the seismic testing, the first stages, that's extremely harmful for their fisheries. They, you know, they had a round of it out here years ago and fish just disappeared from where they normally go. They had to go hundreds of kilometres further. So they've got to blast something to get down 2.3 kilometres and then project through the sea for yes. another two and a half. Yes. Yes. That's what, what I'm talking about. What sort of blast has got yeah. to be let off can, to can do you, that? Can you imagine? Really interesting to hear how they'd done it and they were just awesome guys and just bloody legends. If you are going to stop them, you have to believe that you really can do it. And you can. Guys like him and so many others that I've met along this trip really had pretty amazing connection with over what they've been fighting for here and what I've been fighting for back in Australia and they'll be friends for life. Back in Australia you know, we've seen huge opposition all over the country with paddle outs every weekend for the last couple of months. We're trying to bring that over to Oslo today. There's an incredible vibe out in the water. People were fired up, so we should be. These guys are you know, they're trying to take away our lifestyles and we're not going to put up with it. You is me. I think I've got problems. It's not you is a hell of a lot of people in that town work for oil companies. And then meet the CEO, like, that was a pretty amazing opportunity. I showed him the surfers that are in the fisheries. Rock Lobster, Corn Association, Tuna, the Abalone. I don't change the thought of breaking your heart. I'm so sorry to blame. I was never planning on being an activist, but your plans represent a project that threatens my whole existence. I had no choice, and that is exactly how these other Aussies feel. No, we've got to fight bloody harder than ever and to stop this thing going ahead this is a, a real line in the sand you know we need to start saving the special places in the world and we can't just keep on pushing ahead with fossil fuel exploration we need to start putting our, our money and smarts towards sustainable energies and a more sustainable lifestyle full stop so there we go. And I mean, it's amazing to think that that campaign came out as a win. Like I did not, when I sat in the AGM and watched Heath in there with about 300 suits, all giving themselves pay rises, I did not think we were going to win, but they literally won. And it's a phenomenal, like a win for the environment. So I guess to finish, like the last thing I wanted to say um, to you guys is uh, like, what does your community and your environment mean to you and what action can you take to protect it and um i hope that some of the little things i've touched on today could like help you think about that like if you do see a problem with your rivers or your street or your, your you know your freshwater areas or surf areas or town like what can you do to sort of drive change forward and um you know, it's important to go out and vote. It's important to put your money where your mouth is. Like all those things. I know Patagonia products are expensive, but support any anything slightly more sustainable or more, um, you know, something with a bit more longevity is going to just be way less impactful and the more sensible option. So that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much for chatting. Happily take questions, Chris. Um, but I know we're sort of tight on time. But thanks, guys. That's, that's awesome, Gabe. Um, so it's, it's just, 
yeah, phenomenal. Thank, thanks ever so much. That's really, really um, insightful and inspiring. Um, yeah, thanks so much for your time. A uh, uh, couple of questions. I, I am a little bit mindful of the time. It's um, five past nine. A couple of questions for you here, Gabe, that have come in. Um, so one from Anna. Anna's, Anna's asking, um, could you uh, kindly share your view on the impact of Brexit on the UK beaches and the marine ecosystem? Do you, what, what, what do you, I mean, it's a bit of a crystal ball, isn't it? What, what do you think possibly um, the impact is going to be? The, yeah, the Brexit impact. Um, I know on the sort of business side, it's, it, it is a difficult one. Like there's still so many uncertainties. Uh, I know the brand's worried about costs of goods going up because of um, import duties. That's a big one. Um, is there a benefit to it? The only benefit I could see would be that if the government really stuck its um, stuck its oar in and said we want like marine protected areas, that's basically the one thing that we could do to improve our coastline. Is basically you'd have um, you know, there's a big argument for 30 by 30, which basically means 30 percent of the ocean by 2030 should be protected, which you can mean like no industrial fishing. Um, so it's a big glo global like movements to protect areas, and, and if you protect certain areas, there's an overflow of like ecosystem. You know, one area is protected, it's going to like leak leak out into sort of more protected areas. Um, so maybe, who knows? Maybe if this government or the following government really like supports protected areas. That's probably the only win, but I've got to say the EU did a massive amount for water quality. They put in all of the legislation. So if you ever go paddling or surfing on a blue flag beach, it wasn't really the UK government um, driving the water quality standards, which made the water companies improve their game. It came from the EU. So the EU did loads to support environmental health. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so... Maybe maybe they can go a level higher, but I mean, who knows? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, B saying, you know, it would be, wouldn't it be amazing if um, all of the eco uh, people concerned in the UK and Ireland could combine, and as a collective, the uh, strength of our voice would be so much greater, wouldn't it? Um, but that's that's a, you know, I think we're slowly moving towards it. Um, the super trawlers, the super trawlers, there was just today there was an article about how the super trawlers are um, infringing on our UK coastal waters and the yeah. damage that that's doing. Um, I want to ask you, or Declan wants to ask you a question, Gabe. Um, so this is going back a little bit to the surfing side of things. Do you think the WSL are doing their bit? Um, there is the WSL Pure, which is um, the sort of an environmental sort of focused side. I know there's a couple of projects they're working on, actually. Um, there's one around the Maldives, like overdevelopment in the, in the Maldives. The WSL is like, you know, it's turned into more of a media company, especially now they've cancelled all of their... So for people that don't know, it's the World Surf League. It's like the World Pro Tour of surfing. And um, there's a whole like rabbit hole we could go down about, like, wave pools. Like, how can you justify a wave pool? Um, awesome waves, but at what sort of environmental cost? But the WSL, what it does have is an audience. So if there's a issue, for example, the one I just mentioned, there's like hotel development in the Maldives that's sort of encroaching on surfing zones and damaging coral reefs, then the WSL is a platform that could get the message out there. Yeah. So I do, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, yeah, it's a platform. And as we all know, it's like, how do we communicate now? You know, you're not really going to events anymore. It's more about digital communities and platforms about how we can like communicate in this world and so on that level it's good uh, and they've, they've got a, a massive audience haven't they the wsl so you know they they certainly are in, are uh, in the position of influence mm -hmm. um so so I'll, I'll wrap up on with with uh one more question for for you um again um patagonia is just, i'm not quite sure it's who it's actually come from, the, the name is Yardhouse. Um, amazing product, but uh, for some people, the price um, doesn't necessarily put people off. It may just be, be that it's a little out of their price range. How can we get people away from this fast fashion? Well, um, 
you know that classic saying, isn't it? Buy cheap, buy twice. It's, it's in, in my eyes, it's it's education, isn't it? Yeah, I think, and I, we, I mean, we're constantly like pushing us, push, or Patagonia is constantly pushing itself to like, are we really getting the message across? Like, it's it's also, I mean, there's the price of the product is one thing, but there's the sort of impact of the product is another thing that we don't often shout about and i know other brands don't either in the backs of our t-shirts we do say it's like it's all it's like usually 50 percent organic cotton 50 percent recycled material um and it'll give you like the exact footprint of the product so it's like how much water it's used um how many bottles went into the the recycle you know the recycle what was taken out of the supply chain and so it's like it's like the, the cost it's the physical cost of like the t-shirt cost 25 quid but the, is it fair trade? Is it organic? Is it recycled? Has it got a lifetime guarantee? Like you suddenly lay, is it 1% for the planet? Is it B Corp? Is it like all of these things suddenly like add this other layer of value, which I appreciate like not everyone can afford it and not every brand can afford to do it. But if you've got the option to lean in that direction and support a like-minded brand, I'm not saying it's Patagonia, but there's other awesome brands out there doing their thing. Like that's, you know, it's literally you've got to sort of act on it and then we're never going to change the high street as such, but well, maybe that's wrong because you know, who's going to the high street these days? Like this year's yeah. things are changing, aren't they? And people aren't going to the high street very much. So maybe the high street's time's up, you know? But, um, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a challenge that we've, you know, we've got to up our messaging and other brands are to up their game. Yeah, well, I mean, perhaps Kenya, in my eyes, are leading the, leading the way with this, Gabe. And I, I mean, that statement you made about the other wetsuit companies being aware of, of the ULEX and, and not supporting the free trade side of things, um, that's really opened my eyes on, on yeah. Um, well, Gabe, all I can say, it's been an honor, my friend, to chat chat with you tonight and for everyone listening i hope you've enjoyed um gabe's presentation um it's certainly been inspiring and um thank you ever so much gabe for your time what i would like to say to people is um if you have any questions um you can email us direct and we can put them to gabe uh, if we can't answer on his behalf um we have we have got another uh, presentation tomorrow, another webinar. This is um, from a lady um, called Cal Major, and she's a prolific stand-up paddle water and environmentalist. And she has recently completed a trip down the Severn, and she'll be uh, running a webinar tomorrow to tell us of her efforts and her experiences. So if you want to tune into that, that's at 8 o'clock. Um, and then we will also be running more webinars, which we will announce via our Facebook page. So finally, I just I say once again, Gabe, thanks ever so much. It's um, been an absolute pleasure. Thanks to everyone who's tuned in on this Saturday evening. Um, lovely to see some familiar names and lovely to see some new names. So I wish you all well. Have a great Sunday and um, take care, everyone. Thanks ever so much. Cheers, Gabe. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much. All the best, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, bye. Good night. Yeah. <laughs>